Church, open your Bibles. We are going to be in the book of Acts today, Acts chapter 10, if you want to turn there. I have something really special planned for us today. You notice that we've got a couple of others on the stage, and I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. We're going to expand on something we've talked about a little earlier this month. We're going to talk more today about what we're calling My Relational Network. What we mean by that is the group of people that you spend normal time with in your day in and day out life. It could be people like, for instance, your extended family or individuals in your neighborhood. It could be individuals at your school, at your work. Perhaps it's individuals that are on a sports team or some club that you're a part of. Those are the people that are part of the normal warp and woof of life. You see them very regularly. And, you know, with summer coming up, that's even more important because, well, summer in Seattle means that we're all outside a whole lot more. We're ex extending a time and relationships with individuals that for most of the time during the winter, maybe we don't see as much. So summer brings us into that season where perhaps this is even a little bit more important. Those individuals are gifts to us, uh, given by the Holy Spirit in order that we would interact with those people, we would care at some level for those individuals, and of course have the opportunity to tell the hope of the gospel to. Well, today I have the privilege of setting up this time, and I'm going to use uh, Acts chapter 10 to do that, and then Pastor Nick is going to be up to talk to you a little bit more about what we're calling your social networks. Again, it's part of your whole relational network. And Peter's going to be up to tell us a little bit more and prepare us for thinking about our neighborhoods, the places where we live. I want to open today with a story from the Bible, and the individual that we're going to learn about is Cornelius. And so if you open your Bibles, Acts chapter 10, and we're going to read about this individual, uh, actually the first Gentile that uh, came to know the Lord, or one of the first Gentiles that came to know the Lord in the early church. Here's how it's written in Acts chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all of his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he st stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and his devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The story opens up about a man who is a very righteous man. But if you're a Jewish person, you can hear the record scratch. <coughs> Hold on a second. Did you say a Roman soldier? Because Jews didn't much like Roman soldiers, and so my mind is already racing with, how can this be the devout, righteous guy? It's a good likelihood that this is being told to us by code that this guy is a convert to Judaism. He's a convert to a local synagogue. He's a proselyte, meaning that he's learning how to become a Jew and how to keep Jewish law. And that's why it says that he gives alms, he's praying continuously, and he is, has a level of devotion to the Lord. But I want you to notice something about that. As much as we see this guy, and he's just an outstanding character, and again, he's pleasing to God, his reward for being pleasing to God is, yeah, I want to give you the message about Jesus. And so all of the good things about him were not enough for his salvation. He needed Peter to come and ultimately tell him about the Lord and, and, and deliver to him a righteousness that was not his own. It's a great reminder to all of us that we have good people around us, caring people around us, people that are noble and, and have good character around us, but that by itself is not enough to save any of us. All of them have sinned at some point. Nobody is perfect. And let me remind you about maybe that class that you had in high school or in college. You remember that, that professor. Maybe it was a chemistry professor. Maybe it was a math teacher of some kind or somebody in English. And you remember, they were among the hardest of your instructors. And everybody who took their tests seemingly didn't measure up and, you know, didn't get a mediocre grade at best. 
And you remember the students in the class were always saying, teacher, why don't you grade on the curve? They always happened to be the better students in class. They knew they didn't earn an A, but if they graded on the curve, they'd make it. They'd make that, that A that they really wanted. And, you know, sometimes that teacher would do that. Other times that teacher would say, no, I'm not going to do that. We're all going to just push on a little higher. Well, you know, that is a good example to us, again, of God saying, hey, I'm not grading on the curve here. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All people need uh, Jesus. All people need the gospel. All people need forgiveness. And Cornelius is among those people. As pleasing as he was to God, God said, I want you to learn about Jesus, my son, and have a complete uh, forgiveness, a complete restoration to me that's found through him. All right, let's go on with the story. I'm not going to read the rest of the story, but I want to recount it to you. Uh, Cornelius does send the, the three servants of his to pick up Peter. And Peter, uh, on the, on the, while they're on the way, he doesn't know they're on the way, goes up to the rooftop in order to pray. And you remember the very iconic prayer that happens with Peter. There is a sheet that's lowered from heaven, and it's got all of these animals on it. And he is told to kill and eat those animals. Now, the problem was, a bunch of the animals on that were not kosher. They were out of bounds for a Jewish person to eat. And so immediately, Peter responds and says, God, I I would never eat some of those things. I mean, these Jewish lips have never tasted bacon or shrimp. There's no way I could eat those things. And so, you know, know, don't tempt me like that. But God says, hey, what I have made clean, uh, don't, don't turn away from. And so he's saying, I'm declaring to you, those things are clean for you to eat. And so Peter, in his dream and the vision, eats those things that are on that sheet. Now, now here's why that makes a difference. It makes a difference because what is really happening there is God is preparing Peter to meet Cornelius. A Roman centurion that would have been scorned is a guy that he's going to go to. And somebody, again, that is a Gentile is a guy that he's going to go to with the gospel. And by himself, Peter is not ready to do that. So as much as God is working on the heart of Cornelius, God is working on the heart of Peter. Because Peter has to be prepared to enter the life of this individual that he has felt is out of bounds or foreign in some way. And God is working on all of our hearts the exact same way. He is preparing us to enter the lives of individuals that we might normally say are kind of out of bounds for us or out of sight for us or different culture from us. Let me give you an example of that. It happened just last week. Last week was Turk Sunday, and I loved that day. And we went back across the street, and we had this big party of all things Turk, and we listened to Turkish music, and we drank Turkish tea and Turkish coffee. And I have a picture here of what was on the table before it was kind of devoured. And the thing that is closest to me is something that some of you tasted, not all of you tasted, but I want to tell you about that today. The dish was made for us by a Turkish woman, and her name is Halal. She made it as a gift to us as a congregation so that we could appreciate Turkish culture. Some of you ate that, some of you didn't, but for those of you who did eat it, I want you to know it's called Sig Kotve, and Sig Kotve is actually raw meat that has spices kind of mixed in with it. So some of you did not know that last week you were eating raw meat. Uh, Send all of your email to Peter if you got sick in any way. So I know he'd love to know about that. But you know what? We all enjoyed it. And Peter ate it and uh, lots of people ate it and they said it was wonderful. But if if you had known that ahead of time, well, maybe you would have had a little second thought about that. And I'm pointing that out because if we are going to love Turkish people, we are going to probably eat some things that we, well, have not eaten before. And we're going to try some things that maybe we haven't tried before. And that's what it means to love people. And again, here's my big point, is God's preparing you to enter the lives of individuals that maybe you would not have normally entered. I've got something on the screen here for you. You were handpicked and strategically placed by God to make an eternal impact on the people you oftentimes see every day. And so God is saying, I'm preparing you to enter the lives of those individuals and to make a difference. All right, let me bring the story to a close of what happens because Peter does go to Cornelius. He, of all things, as a Jew, does enter the house of this Gentile. And he goes in and all of Cornelius and all of his family are ready. They're on the edge of their seat, ready to hear what Peter has to offer. And Peter tells them the gospel of Jesus. And he tells them the story, and they all respond with a a yes. 
and even wish to be baptized, and something else happens at that moment, they all break out and they begin speaking in tongues. They were speaking languages they had never learned. And for Peter, that was both affirming and astonishing. Affirming because, well, it's like, wow, the same thing that happened to us in Jerusalem when we came to know the Lord and the Holy Spirit fell upon us has now happened with the Gentiles. And so it was a message to him that the Jews and the Gentiles are now welded into one in Christ within the church. And, and so this was a very, very good Good thing and good news that this gospel was spreading in this way and entering the lives of Cornelius and his entire household. Here's the deal. It begins with our willingness to serve God, to go where He wants us to go, to say what He wants us to say, and to enter the lives of the people that He wants us to enter. Let me give you a story and then I'm going to turn things over to Pastor Nick. Uh, I want to take you all the way back to 1993. And it was the inaugural year in which the Colorado Rockies had just come to Colorado, to Denver. And my wife and I lived there. It was an expansion of a major league team. It was a big deal within the city that had never had major league baseball. And you know, the male mind works in very crazy ways. And this male mind was working in a crazy way. And I said, you know, I I could take advantage of this. There are all kinds of fans that are coming to root on the Rockies for the very, very first time. And I bet that's just a very eager crowd. And so my mind started racing. I said, you know what? I am going to make and market a foam finger. And so I developed the idea in my mind. And I found a person that would cut foam in town. And I found a little silk screening person that would silk screen stuff that said, we will rock you. And I told Denise, this is just going to be, I mean, we are struggling in seminary. We're down on funds. But believe me, this is going to hit the big time. So we made 500 of these in my garage. And I went down for opening day and I was just warming up and I had my foam finger out. And, you know, I felt like a kind of peanut salesman there, you know, as everybody's going by. And I think I maybe sold eight my first day. And Denise had said to me, you know, are you sure? Are you sure about this? Oh, I'm so sure about this, honey. This is going to be a great, great thing. We will rock you the, the foam finger. It's going to work. Well, I went down maybe another 12 times in the first month. And, well, there's still, you know, 650 in my garage. You know, they just, they're not selling like hotcakes. I studied in those days at McDonald's, and in McDonald's, uh, by the way, that was kind of before Starbucks was everywhere, and that's where you kind of went, and I I hung out there, had coffee, and I met a person at Starbucks, and his name was Burton Beatty, and Burton and I were kind of sharing life a little bit, and I was telling Burton about my foam finger idea, and I said, you know, I just don't have time to get down there. I know it's going to take off. These are going to sell, and Burton said, I will be your marketing manager. I said, man, that would be great. I'll give you a cut of the sales and, you know, let's do this. And so Burton Beatty started going down and selling the foam fingers. And, you know, he made a little bigger dent than I did, but still nothing to write home about. But Burton and I kept on meeting at, at, at McDonald's. And Burton and I got to know each other and I got to know more about his life. And one day I asked Burton, would you like to trust Jesus? I mean, the conversation had gotten to the spiritual part of it. And to my surprise, he said, yes, I do. I said, would you like to pray with me right now? Yes, I would. And Burton Beatty at McDonald's trusted Jesus as his Savior. And, you know, it wasn't just a little light thing, too. I mean, he actually ended up coming to church and becoming a part of the church with us. I mean, it was, it was like a huge deal. And I came away from that, and Denise and I still to this day, I hold on to this foam finger because it's, you know, again, an a $800 sermon illustration for number one. Uh, but I hold on to this because it was not about a foam finger at all. It was about a young man who didn't even know he needed salvation, didn't even know he needed the Lord. And in McDonald's over a summer in 1993, came to know Jesus as his Savior and his life would be changed forever. God is preparing you to enter the lives of people all around you. And we just have to be aware of what he's doing. Nick, come tell us a little bit more. A lot of dust flying off that thing. (laughs) 
93, I was one years old. So. You're about to go on sabbatical, I gotta give you a hard time. When I was in seminary, I remember that I had a motivation tactic that spurred me on near the end of the semester. About a month out, I began telling myself that in one month, this will all be behind you. And so I would then begin to rehearse that at the beginning of each week until that very last week, where then I would break it down into hours. Okay, so 168 hours left this week. If I'm getting roughly eight hours of sleep, 112 waking hours. And then I'd take all the hours that I was occupied for the week and then take what I have left over and tell myself, wow, you know, you've got, like, looks like 60 plus hours to get it all done. That's a lot of time. You've got this. Then I'd map out every single minute onto my calendar and tell myself, get it done, push through, get to the other side, get all those projects finished. I wish I could say that things were different for me today. But often I begin my day with the end in mind, the end of the day when our son is in bed and I get my time either to be with my wife or read a book. I just see my day as something to get done so that I can get to my time, something to get through. What I'm advocating for in my few minutes that I have this morning is to see each day, each thing on the calendar as an opportunity, not something to get through. Each day is an opportunity to bring the hope of the gospel to neighbors and nations through our relational networks. Again, Brian's already mentioned it. And as you may recall, I'll be heading up our efforts as the captain for my relational networks. And so what I want to do today is help us in that area to see each day as an opportunity, not just something to get through. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 reminds us, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. For us to do that, we need to prepare and be aware. Let me repeat that. It's quite simply all I have to share with you today. Prepare and be aware. For us to see each day as an opportunity, an opportunity to bring the hope of the gospel to neighbors and nations, we need to prepare and be aware. Before I unpack that practically, though, let me remind you again what we mean, and Brian's already shared this a little bit, by my relational networks. Again, this is the social web of connections in your life, the relationships present, thick or thin, that help define you and make you who you are. No man or woman is an island, and you are not you without others. And plenty of those others don't know Christ. So let me give you just three relational areas or networks, spheres of influence, so to speak, where you can, by preparation and awareness, turn that thing to get done into an opportunity. The three areas I want to go over are family, work, and what I'm calling commitments. Family, work, and commitments. And with each one, I'm going to tell you quickly, just again, an introduction and a foretaste of what's to come. Simply ways to prepare and be aware. And guess what? Simplicity is best. So with each one, the application points are the same. We've got to start somewhere, right? So first one with family. Every single day, you probably have some sort of interaction with family members, whether it be moms or dads, aunts or uncles, spouses, kids, brothers, sisters, extended family. We've all got some family that we're interacting with, not to mention this church family, but we'll stick to the flesh and blood for now. Here's how you can prepare to bring the hope of the gospel to your family, which, again, quick sidebar, um, we... Uh, are bringing the hope of the gospel. I'm talking about bringing the hope of the gospel to non Christians in our relational networks, but we must remember as Christians, we never get past the gospel. It's something that's foundational and sustaining to our faith. Nobody ever moves past the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the riches that that brings us. I just had to say that really quickly. Okay, coming back. Two quick ways to prepare for your family one, work on you, work on you. A wise pastor once told me on my first day at this job that you can't give what you don't have. Of course, the Spirit works in our weaknesses and gives to us even when we don't have much to give. But we need to continue to cultivate ourselves and grow in wisdom, as Ephesians 5 reminds us. Work on you by prayer and Bible reading, silence and solitude, simplicity, slowing down, and 
Gasp. Coming to church to be with people and rubbing shoulders with those who aren't like you. Work on you to reach your family. And also, invest in some prayer cards. Okay? I'll explain that in a second. One of the greatest gifts of God's grace to humanity is writing. One surefire way to not forget things, especially your family members, is writing things down. Take the time to make prayer cards, one a day even, where you write down your family member's name, maybe some scripture, and a few things you can pray over them, requests or praises. And taking the time to do this and then adding it as a rhythm into your daily devotional life will be a game changer. It's slow. I've built my prayer cards up over three years, but now I don't forget and I'm able to update them and follow them with my family. Again, a really quick example is if you want, we have a bunch of these praying lives, uh, A Praying Life by Paul Miller. It's a great book. talks about making prayer cards. And then just simply grab some note cards anywhere in your house and start writing the names, some scriptures, some prayer requests for people and come back to it time and time again. Add it to your devotional life. Devotional life. I have some examples on the screen there too. So those are two ways you can prepare for your family. Work on you and make some prayer cards. And here's the other way that you can, again, be aware. So prepare and aware for your family. Pause and pray. Pause and pray. Each morning, each commute, each little gap in our calendar, the tiniest moments can remind you to be aware for opportunities. Take a deep breath and pause and pray. Pray the Lord's Prayer, the Sinner's Prayer, the two greatest commandments, any scripture you've got memorized. Pause and pray in the tiny gaps of your day. Pause and pray. That's family. Let's move on to work. And again, the applications are the same. How do you prepare for work? You want to work on you. Don't see your bosses or coworkers, especially the ones you don't like, as enemies, but as image bearers and sinners just like you. Make prayer cards for them too. Write out all the coworkers you have on those cards and begin to pray for them at home or at work. Make the time to do this. Don't try and find the time. Guess what? You won't find the time. You have to make the time to do this. You got to make it. And when you do that, it frees you up for opportunities, not duties. And then finally, aware. How do you have awareness at work? It's the same thing. Pause and pray. Before each meeting, before each phone call or email, pause and pray. Yes, even emails can be prayed over. Trust me, I do it all the time. Pause and pray. Breathe. This is an opportunity, not just something to get done. And lastly, let me close with commitments. And here's what I mean by this. You're committed to helping your neighbor, maybe down the street, with weekly tasks, you're committed to coaching or participating on a sports team, like the men's softball team. You're committed to a club or an organization, whatever it might be, for whatever season, you're committed to someone or something. Prepare by, again, working on you. Are you dreading something on your calendar that's a commitment? I have that. See it as an opportunity, not just something to get past. Spend time praying, thinking, and talking to God about that commitment. Prayer cards. Make some prayer cards for the things and people you're committed to. I'm committed to praying for my old churches and pastors, and I have prayer cards for them. Perhaps you make a card for your neighbor, the kid or the coach or the board member you don't like. Make the time to make the card. And lastly, be aware by pausing and praying. Before you get out of your car to go to that commitment or you walk down the street, take a deep breath and pause and pray. Slow down. Pause and pray. Ask God to open, the, open your eyes for the opportunities before you. And I promise you, this will change things. So there, there you have it. That's all I have to share this morning. It's quite simply, be prepared and be aware by working on you, trying out some prayer cards, and pausing and praying. Let me go ahead and turn it over to Peter now. Nick, all just <clears throat> great ideas. Where were you when I was going to school? Oh, that's right, you weren't born. I, need, I needed that structure, that's for sure. Um, I needed that, but I desired relationships above everything. One of the things I love about what we're doing with Neighbors and Nations is Neighbors is a part of our mission with who we are and how we live our lives. Pick up one of these. 
neighbors are so vital and important, especially in today's generation. We are becoming more and more isolated. But C.S. Lewis says this, he says, friendship is the greatest of worldly goods. Certainly to me, it is the chief happiness of life. I think C.S. Lewis is basically saying, we want to be known. Your neighbors want to be known. You have people next to you, a couple houses down for you that want and need relationship. And you go, please, not me. Maybe that other person can reach out to them. No, he wants to use you. Romans chapter 12 uh, is a great passage from 9 to 21, and it's this characteristics of being a believer. And in the middle, in verse 13, it says to be hospitable. And at the center of hospitality is really to love, to love well. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us if we do all sorts of really good things, but without love, what is it? It's a gong. It's empty. It has no purpose and no meaning. And so you might be doing this. You might be being, being hospitable. And you know what? That is God's grace to you. But what do I do if I'm not? Where do we go? Where do we start? And it is hard. I think we go to prayer. Prayer becomes so important when we go to being able to reach out to those around us. Pray that God will lead you to somebody that you, in your neighborhood that needs what you have in Christ. That becomes really important. What you have in Christ is what people need. And that takes relationship. Be patient with yourself. Relationships take time. Brighton didn't share the Christ with that guy. I still can't believe you created those. How many do you have left? <laughs> Quite a few. But it took time. It took time and relationship and building something that only God can do in the lives of people. Love is where we begin with hospitality. And so it becomes really important that you and I do that. But it also takes good works. Matthew chapter 5, Galatians 6, Ephesians 2, and every single chapter in the book of Titus, it says you and I are created for good works. And really some of those good works is to be hospitable to those around us. So what does that look like? It also means that it looks like that we are to be salt and light. That's what it means. How do we love people well, and how are we hospitable to them? Remember, as Nick said, all of us are Im image bearers of God. Some saved by grace, and some not. The only difference is the grace of God. So how do you look at your neighbors, the people you may interact with, but some of you go, I don't have any action, interaction with my neighbors. Pray for that opportunity to make that happen. Pray that God changes our hearts so that we move to those that are different than us. Maybe we need to repent and say, God, my, my attitude towards my neighbors are not good. Maybe you need to seek forgiveness. But that's a great place to start. I have a story. His name is Jim Schofield about a man who an unlikely friend for me. And matter of fact, I had to seek forgiveness from the Lord that I didn't seek out his relationship sooner. God put us together in a situation where we joined in a Duffer's League of Golf and I played with him. Never had met him before, heard about him. He had a reputation and I never thought that we would ever be friends. But as we began to play golf and spend that 18 holes of golf, four hours talking and interacting, I began to realize that he's not much different than me. Yes, he doesn't know Christ, and yes, some of his actions and some of his thoughts and some of his ways in which he goes about life was completely different than me. We had a lot in common. And so we spent time together a couple more times in golf, and it was so enjoyable. But then I began to realize that he lives 
less than a stone's throw from church. And so I just began to go across the street. He was out working in his yard to go across the street. And it began this warm and incredible relationship that I never thought was possible and realized he's got needs, he has feelings, he has emotions that are just like mine. We spent time over coffee. I'd go into his house and he would make me a latte and we'd sit there and we'd talk. He'd tell me about his kids and the difficulty that they're going through. His wife had a um, child from a previous relationship that was murdered in our town. And we got to pray in this house of this man that I never thought possible. Begin praying. God will change relationships that you never thought possible. And my life was richer because of that. Pray God, pray that God will lead you to be hospitable. I have to do this in my own life. I'm looking at my life going, how do I find the time? And like Nick said, we need to pray. We need to find margins. Maybe I need to sacrifice something so that I can be hospitable. Because God says this is a characteristic of us as believers to be hospitable, to invite people in. So do that. A very actionable thing that we can do, and um, I'm working on this, and I will send out an email to remind you about this, and you can email me, and I'll send this to you, is create a map of your neighborhood. I got this from Dave Bartels. And try to name all your neighbors. Name their kids, name their cats, dogs, whatever. Then put a mark by them, by that, their name on their house. Have I been in their house? Have they been in my house? Do they have any practical needs I can pray for? Send them a card when God directs because you're already saying, God, what do you want me to do? When you make a pie or you make those cookies, make extra, take them over just in the name of the love of God and being hospitable because God has called us to do this. I would ask you to pray and say, God, sometime this summer, Maybe you've done this. Maybe you can do this sooner than later. But pray, God, I want to host either a family or maybe more families or maybe my neighborhood. And we want to host a barbecue. Everybody loves a barbecue. Look for those opportunities to begin developing relationships with people. Why? Because God call, has called us to do that. He's called us to be hospitable. That's part of the characteristic of us as believers. To be hospitable, not only those within the body, but outside of the body of Christ. And why? Because our neighbor, neighbors need to see an actionable, they also need to see an experiential reason that God loves them that you're taking time to care for them. And remember, be patient with yourself. I have to be patient with ourselves. We in the Western world need to be patient with ourselves, that relationships take time. To love people well, take that time to be hospitable. Right? Let's all take a minute and uh, have an attitude of heart that says, uh, here my send me. God, I wish to be used for your purposes. And I think this summer, that's going to start for many of us by just recognizing somebody that's nearby and stepping up. Maybe it's that neighbor. It's a brand new neighbor uh, that just moved into the home recently. They were out playing street hockey the other day, and Denise and I noticed it. We haven't met them yet. How would I have the opportunity to just go out while they're playing street hockey and say, hi. Maybe it's another neighbor I have down the street that I know is a widow or I know is struggling a bit. Maybe it's my time to knock on the door and say, hey, how are you? Those simple words from your mouth, hey, it's nice to meet you. How are you? With an actual look on your face as if I'm listening, I would like to be a part of your life, goes so far. And those are the things that begin to stitch together for bringing the hope of the gospel into people's lives. You are on mission. God is using you to reach neighbors and nations. 
And uh, I can't wait for the stories that he is ready to write as a result of your closeness to Jesus and your desire to love others around you. Father, thank you again for this morning and for the reminder that you've invited us into this big place where you said the harvest is plentiful, uh, but the workers are few. So make us workers that are ready to enter into this harvest field for your glory. Thank you for all the friends, and the relatives, the individuals, the co-workers that are around us. Let us love those individuals well, and let us talk about the hope that's within us, the hope that you've placed there as a result of Jesus. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <music>